So uh, my name is Laura Neville. I'm a CNIO consultant, and I have had the privilege of being at Erlanger System for the last 19 months. And I've participated in their journey of switching over to Epic. And I'm here to share some of the strategies we've used in workflow and redesign of processes. Um, Erlanger System is a safety net system. It's based in Chattanooga. They have six um, hospitals, and they range from level one trauma center to critical access hospitals. And they also have 57 primary and specialty practices that are based in Tennessee, Georgia, and North Carolina. So they have a challenge of um, pretty diverse economical, social, and geographical area to cover. Um, what they had prior to making the decision to go over to Epic, um, as you can see, is they were on 12 different um, electronic health records, and they still had several um, clinics that were on paper. And so you can imagine that if you were attempting to be part of this clinical team and take care of a patient, you might have to go into three different softwares to try to find the right information. They had built nearly 200 interfaces in hopes of collecting the right data in the right places, but as you know, our um, software doesn't talk to each other readily. And so a lot of the time they didn't have the right information at the right time, and they fell at risk a significant amount of the time, and there were a lot of errors made. And so part of their decision on which um, electronic health record they went to was they wanted to make sure they could use a health record that went seamlessly between their clinics, hospitals, emergency departments, and across their entire system. They wanted to work on and um, emphasize in that integrated care. They had a lot of concerns of the medical errors that were um, happening, pharmacy errors in the cost, and also a duplicative test done for diagnostic tests because, again, they were not in one system. And as, as always, the fiscal side wanted to make sure that we're recapturing what we were in fact doing. We're reviewing revenue charge for all of the documentation that was occurring or the diagnostic tests that were occurring, and were we doing adequate coding. So how could we build these and embed that into the electronic health record to help them while improve their staff and patient satisfaction and improve overall efficiency. So their goal was they knew they weren't going to do it perfect, and I really appreciate that they said that out front, mm -hmm. that they wanted to do good. They wanted to try as best as they could to start with a system that people could use and work with and that it was to be based on, we know we're going to have to be flexible and innovative and move forward. And I think that's a really important point, that you're just not going to build that perfect house. And I repeated that several times in the first year about, you've bought a prefab house, you're going to move in, you're not going to like the living room, but you're still going to have a living room to start, and that's what we need to focus on. So the first one area that they wanted to focus on was documentation support. And I want to emphasize by saying Erlanger did not decide to go with a big bang. They decided because of their complexity that they would start a two phase. The first phase was ambulatory for the 57 practices because they wanted to invest in that documentation of problemless medications, allergies, and history so that when they went with phase two, the inpatient and ED colleagues had data to look at and to participate in. So the first area we focused on was documentation support and decisions were made at the physician advisory group level that we were going to have pre-built options and templates, that we were going to work with the departments and practices to build what was the standard they were going to utilize, but they were going to start on day one with templates that they could work with and not have to start from scratch. They also made the decision that any provider could have Dragon that they were going to be able to utilize that if they wanted to, but part of the caveat of that was everybody had to give up dictation because there was concern that people who were going to continue dictating were not going to add to those databases that we needed and were so important to the patient, the problemless allergies medications. Another strategy that they wanted to roll out at the same time was we were going to allow scribes. 
And it was with those discussions that we realized as we were doing training that we had the scribes who were mostly medical assistants and part of their clinical team in the wrong classes because they weren't with the providers as they were looking at the templates and making modifications for them. So we had to, in the last two weeks before Go Live, build a different kind of class for providers and um, scribes together to build their templates and have access to it. These are examples of some of the decisions they made in their primary notes. Um, essentially, what we built was to ensure that when they went into their office encounters, when they went to the notes, they had the buttons to start with the templates that they wanted to. So from day one, the goal and emphasis was, could we get to end of day close of encounters? Um, and currently, yesterday was their one year anniversary and they were very um, happy that they're at 83% that they closed the same day. Um, they also made some decisions and um, I kept on emphasizing this that it's not just documenting but it's also what does it look like after the fact in chart review? What are your colleagues seeing in the next visit? And so they made some decisions about they wanted to emphasize the assessment and plan and we created for them that the subjective and objective was um, collapsed so that every chart review, once you close the encounter, you would see the assessment and plan as an emphasis, but you had the opportunity to expand it if you wanted to. Specialty notes were also emphasized in a different way. We worked with departments to talk about what was their focus and what was their opportunity. This is an example from the orthopedics who felt very frustrated by the coders of they didn't really understand the different levels and codes. And they did a totally different perspective of wanting to have different notes pre-built for the level of service they were supposed to be documenting to. In the phase two, when we went to the inpatient notes, we wanted to make sure in that same strategy that they had in the office how can we embed it in the navigator so that they weren't leaving the area that they were doing a workflow process to complete their note? So within the different navigators of admission, transfer, and discharge, that's where we embedded their notes to work upon and complete. Whew. Okay, clinical process improvement. The lights are really intense, never thought that. Um, <laughs> clinical process improvement, I'm now running out of time, we started looking at how can we use the entire team to their level of expertise. Looking at refill protocols, they turned on SureScripts and ePrescribe for this go live and we set it up so that nurses and medical assistants with a protocol could sign off the refills versus providers at the end of their sessions being hit with 40 refill encounters or plan of care initiations. There was initiative and plans of smart sets set up to, based on your age, gender, and chronic disease, what were you supposed to have done at what time in convention? And when you went into the office encounter, it recommended it. And again, the nursing medical assistant team members could start that. Phase two for the inpatient ED, we continued with that thought process. What kind of protocols could we initiate as the nurse is documenting or the respiratory therapist or the case manager, and if they were triggering that they should be initiating a protocol, that they had the power to do so. We embedded those tool-driven processes into the chart to help them with that process, because this was a daunting change. This was very different from them. They were working in silos, and now we were really encouraging them. This is to work on the team and to share. Some of the providers had trouble with this. The refill process sounded good to them, but they were a little anxious people were making decisions for them. Um, a lot of time was spent with group decision making to explain that the refill process, how it happened. And essentially, as those external um, requests come from pharmacies or once a secretary documented a, a refill request and it went to the refill in basket, it triggered and did an analysis and gave a go green light if they should do it or a red light if they need to seek counsel from the provider. Sepsis also was triggered a best practice alert pre-setting up the decision of these are things you should consider to allow them to set the process of initiating the labs or appropriate and contacting the team. They had not really had a good medication reconciliation process and we wanted to make it as much as possible consistent across the system. So we built the design to look the same for ambulatory ED and inpatient for teams to participate in. 
Pharmacy techs started to do so in the emergency department approximately three years ago, but they were doing it all on paper. We now have them doing it fully within the EHR, and they have started a trial of doing this in the pre-op because it has gone so well in the emergency department. We wanted to make sure that as people were looking in the chart and medication reconciliation was seen not just for the providers but for the pharmacists and the nurses, that everybody knew where we were. So when you open a chart, the first place you go to is the chart summary, and in it, on the top, as you can see, was where are we in the admission? Have we gotten the medication review done? Have we gotten the medication reconciliation done? And trying to streamline the process in the navigator also encouraging for the providers, as the example I show you, that they had a checklist of what they needed to do with links to go to what they needed. Way behind. I'm going to quickly sum this up. The next thing was all the work they were doing to try to help them pass along that information appropriately for transition of care. So the minute they documented it in the ED, inpatient, or in an office specialty encounter, who was the follow-up providers, that triggered automatically at the close of those visits, either by discharge or the close of the encounter, that the um, <coughs> summary of care note was sent either via fax or electronically to the provider they had listed. So it was no longer their responsibility to try to remember what was to be passed on. That was created for them and happened automatically. And last, I would just emphasize, I think it's really important when we're building these things to be thinking about transparently what we build. Sometimes we build different views for different people on the team, and I think it adds to the confusion. And if we could focus on the transparency of having the view being for the team and the roles being different for our processes and what they see, I think it serves us better. Thank you. <laughs>